Good afternoon uh, and welcome to uh, what I know is going to be a very insightful uh, seminar today regarding uh, a topic we've all been interested in for a while. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Greg Ferry Good afternoon. And I am the chair of the United States Access Board. <clears throat> Our topic today will be the results uh, of the Access Board sponsored and congressionally mandated study on the technical feasibility of using wheelchair securement systems in passenger aircraft. Uh, in uh, the FAA Reauthorization Act, Congress directed the Access Board to conduct a study of feasibility uh, of equipping aircraft with securement systems so that passengers can remain in their wheelchairs during the flight. The Access Board determined that the Transportation Research Board, a component of the National Academies of Science, Engineer, Engineering, and Medicine, was the best situated to conduct this study. The TRB put together an incredible team of aviation and engineering professionals who volunteered their time uh, to work on this study. Our presenters uh, from the TRB will tell you about the team in just a few moments. I would like to note that while the Access Board uh, contracted with TRB to conduct the study. The Access Board was not part of the study committee, uh, did not participate in the closed section, sessions of the committee, uh, nor in the preparation of this report. We were not privy to the conclusions and the findings of the committee prior to the receipt of the advanced copy of the committee report, which we did receive on September 7th. The findings and conclusions of the TRB, which you are about to hear from the representatives of the study committee, are the opinions of the study committee and do not necessarily reflect the views of the United States Access Board. The, passenger, the passage of the Air Carriers Act uh, 35 years ago, air traveler with disabilities had become to experience greater accessibility and freedom as it relates to air travel. Uh, we should rightfully celebrate the strides that have been made, but also recognize that many challenges do remain. From difficulty transferring in the cabin to an inordinate delays of waiting assistance to damaged mobility devices and challenges in the reservation process, among other barriers. Air travelers with disabilities know full well the lack of access is still present as they seek to fly around the country for business and leisure. We should all bear in mind the many opportunities to improve equality in air travel experience does exist. And one such opportunity is bringing us together today. The possibility that users of power as well as manual wheelchairs might someday be able to remain in their devices in the aircraft during the flight. Before we turn our attention to our presenters, who are going to brief us on the study committee's findings on this topic, note that if you can submit questions using the Q&A feature uh, on the Zoom at any time in the presentation, and our moderator will pose them to the presenters during the Q&A session uh, of the event. So with that, it's my pleasure, and I want to extend a warm welcome as well as much appreciation on behalf of the board to TRB study director, Melissa Welch Ross. Greg, you are muted. Me, Greg. Okay. Did I become unmuted? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I was. I have no idea how that happened. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm pleased to welcome four members of the TRB Study Committee who will be briefing us today on the committee's final report. Let me introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Alan M. Jeanette, who served as chair of the study committee. He's a professor and dean of emeritus 
at the Boston University Sargent College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. He also serves as a professor of rehabilitation sciences at the Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professionals. He is an, an international expert on rehabilitation and a leader in developing patient-centered rehabilitation outcomes uh, measured in the range of challenging uh, clinical areas such as uh, work disability, post-accurate care, post-acute care, uh, spinal cord injuries, neurological and orthopedic, and geriatric conditions. He has authored more than 250 publications in the rehab sciences field and has served as a principal investigator for numerous studies funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. The Agency for Health Care Research and Quality, as well as several other foundations. He has served as a member of more than a dozen national academies, boards, and committees. Uh, he has received numerous professional awards and honors, including the American Physical Therapy Association, Macmillan Award, and the Foundation for Physical Therapy, Charles M. Mastrovo uh, Academy of Medicine in 2013. He earned a bachelor's degree in physical therapy uh, from the New York at Buffalo and a master's degree in, and a PhD in public health from the University of Michigan. Accompanying him is Naomi Amati, is the principal planner for the Oakland, California office of Nelson Nagari, which is a transportation and mobility planning consultancy. Her expertise is in planning, accessible transportation with the focus on people with disabilities, seniors, and equity issues. She serves as the paratransit coordinator uh, from Alameda County Transportation Commission from 2006 to 2016. She also worked on projects at uh, Cortana Costa and Santa Clara counties uh, for the Bear Area Rap Rapid Transit System and the Metropolitan Transportation System, system uh, as well as the California State Transportation Agency. She is chair of the Bay Area Regional Mobility Management Group and is, an, and is active in the women's transportation seminars. In 2014, she received a Bay Area WTS Rosa Parks Diversity and Leadership Award and an MTC Doris W. Kahn Accessibility Transportation Award. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley in anthropology and psychology, as well as a master's degree in transportation management from the Meta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Also part of the uh, study group is Marion M. Manry. She is the lead research engineer in the biosciences group of the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. She worked for UMTRI for more than 30 years, conducting research in the fields of wheelchair transportation safety, child passenger safety, occupant protection, vehicle ergonomics, and occupant accommodation. She conducts and supervises sled impact evaluation for child restraints, wheelchair, wheelchair securement systems, and wheelchair occupant restraint systems. In addition to her expertise in wheelchair transportation safety, she has extensive experience in analysis of motor vehicle crashes, crash dummy design, injury criteria for the development of occupant uh, anthropological, as well as postural qualifications, engineering analysis of federal motor vehicle safety standards, child passenger restraints, and the factors affecting child restraint installation errors. She is chair of the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America Committee on Wheelchairs and Transportation and led the 2012 and 2017 revisions of the RISNA standards on wheelchair and transportation. She has served as the head of the United States Delegation for International Organizations 
for standardization and has led the development efforts for standards for wheelchair used uh, wheelchairs used in seats in motor vehicle transportation tie downs and occupant restraint systems. She holds a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Tulane and has a master's degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan. Finally, Gary Wessel is the founder uh, and the managing officer of Kronos Aviation Consulting, which provides a wide variety of services to airlines, leasing companies, uh, original equipment manufacturers, and suppliers in the aviation industry, including services pertaining to aircraft interiors and modifications and conversions. In this position, he led all of the firm's activities, including asset management, aircraft specifications, and interior management, as well as marketing, forecasting, OEM strategy consulting, as well as prior to start, uh, as well, prior to starting Kronos, he was the co-managing officer of aviation and aerospace practices at CICF Aviation, where he led the firm's staff of more than 50 consultants in seven offices worldwide. Before joining ICF, he was a senior program manager with BE Aerospace Seating Products Group, where he ran numerous seating programs for major international airlines. Prior to that, he spent nine years with Delta Airlines in various positions within his engineering and technological space departments. He is a member of the Senior Advisory Board and guest uh, senior board and guest lecturer for Georgia Institute of Technology School of Aerospace Engineering. He was the lead author for the International Air Transportation Association Best Practices Guidelines for Cabin Interior Retrofits and Entry into Service Programs. He is a frequent speaker at industrial conferences, industry conferences, and is regularly quoted in industry publications. <clears throat> He has appeared on CNN and NBC Nightly News as an aviation expert. He holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Jeanette, Ms. Armada, Ms. Manry, and Mr. Wessel, uh, to you and your follow committee members, we afford a great thanks for you volunteering your time and expertise into this study over the last two years. Your committee carried out its charges with great dedication, diligence, and integrity. And we at the Access Board could not be more grateful for your hard work. So everybody, please join me in offering our colleagues a round of virtual applause. And with that, team, the floor is yours. Thanks, Greg. I think you're gonna need to mute your phone or that's gonna have echo. On your computer, try to unmute yourself and on your phone, mute yourself, please. Are you able to see my slides now? Yes, we do now. Okay, well, thank you, Greg, for that introduction. And I want to, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is that, is that better? Okay. 
I want to thank the U.S. Access Board for all their support during our study. And I also want to begin by thanking Melissa Welch Ross, who is the study director, for her outstanding guidance throughout the study, as well as Mr. Thomas Menzies, who is the director of Con consensus studies at the Transportation Research Board. The committee had tremendous support from the Transportation Research Board, and we really appreciated that. And I also want to thank each member of the committee for their outstanding service. And now I'll begin to share our, our study report with you. And then uh, my colleague, Gary Wieso will also share our findings. And then I'll wrap up the presentation of our slides, and then we can open it up for questions. The U.S. Congress called on the Access Board to conduct a study looking at the feasibility of in-cabin wheelchair restraint systems, and if the committee felt they were feasible, to look at the ways in which individuals who have significant disabilities who use wheelchairs, including power wheelchairs, might be accommodated with the systems. And we were asked to consult with the Secretary of Transportation, airplane manufacturers, air carriers, and disability advocates during the study. And I wanna emphasize that our focus was on looking at the feasibility, not recommending whether or not these securement systems should in fact be put into planes. We had a very diverse committee and the listing of each member is shown on this slide. And we had representatives from the airline interior design and engineering field, airplane crash worthiness standards, testing and certification, airline operations and safety, as well as wheelchair and assistive technology design, performance, and crash worthiness, people with backgrounds in transportation accessibility for persons with disability, as well as experts in the area of economics, rehab, and policy analysis. So it was a very diverse committee that worked together. And our statement of task is shown on this slide. We were asked to assess and evaluate the conditions under which it could be technically feasible to equip passenger aircraft with in-cabin restraint systems for both motorized and non-motorized wheelchairs, including the, fo the following components. We were asked to look at design, engineering, and safety requirements for both the installation and the use of these restraint systems that could be used as seats in aircraft, including aircraft structural requirements, occupant restraint, as well as passenger emergency evacuation requirements. We were also asked to look at injury criteria limits for both wheelchair users and occupants of seats behind and adjacent to the wheelchair user. And, to look at the implications on FAA regulations and policies for airworthiness, crashworthiness, and other safety requirements. So those were the three major areas of feasibility. And then if the committee found reasonable circumstances for equipping airplanes, then we were asked to consider how to accommodate effectively the passengers who would use the wheelchair securement systems and provide a level of service comparable to other passengers. And then finally, we were asked to advise on further actions that could be warranted for making public policy choices, included needed future research, information gathering, and other technical analyses. I want to clarify a few of the terms that we use in our report. Instead, we, we talk about power and manual wheelchairs, as well as a personal wheelchair, which is a wheelchair owned by the user. And we make a distinction between a securement device, which is the device or devices that are used to tie down 
or attach the wheelchair to a vehicle versus occupant restraints, such as belts and straps, which are used to secure the wheelchair user to the wheelchair. Now, as a committee, our approach was to look at and examine the most significant technical issues that would need to be addressed for wheelchair securement systems to progress from concept to design and implementation with particular attention to any technical challenges that would be so formidable that they would hinder or thwart this progress. We focused on potential challenges to the development and implementation of a wheelchair securement system that could do two things. First, be installed on a sufficient number of airplanes to provide non-ambulatory individuals with enough offerings going beyond a niche service to something that was more meaningful and a securement system that could accommodate an individual's personal wheelchair as opposed to a wheelchair that was designed and optimized specifically for airplane travel. So keep that in mind in terms of our report. In terms of the technical considerations our committee looked at, we examined whether airplanes common to airline service have enough doorway and interior space for entering, exiting, and performing necessary maneuvers to get from the door into a securement space, to look at whether or not the airline or the airplane floor in its structure could accommodate the loadings, and whether a secured personal wheelchair can meet the crash worthiness, the occupant injury protection, and other relevant air transportation safety requirements of the FAA. Now, our report, which you can access at the National Academy's uh, website, is organized into five chapters. Our first chapter is an introduction where the committee attempted to create a context for why this study was felt to be important and then to outline our charge and our approach. Chapter two presents background for the reader, both in terms of wheelchair characteristics as well as airline industry and the airplanes themselves. Chapter three focuses on crashworthiness and other safety considerations. And then chapter four focuses on airplane space considerations. And then the final chapter, chapter five, presents our findings and our recommended next steps, which Gary and I will summarize for you this afternoon. Now, just for a little background before Gary pre presents the results. With respect to airplanes, there are more than 6,000 active airplanes in the U.S. passenger airline fleet today. However, there are fewer than 10 major airplane families and different models within those families, and the interior layouts differ widely. However, there are certain dimensions that are quite consistent, such as doorway, cabin interior widths, which are uniform for airplanes in a given family. And then it's important to note that the Boeing 737 and the Airbus A320 families are the predominant families of airplanes in the US operating today. With respect to wheelchairs, it's important to realize that there are hundreds of different wheelchair models of different sizes, performance levels, and different configurations. Now, the vast majority of wheelchairs can maneuver within the clearance and clear space parameters specified in the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA, and their access guidelines. And these ADA guideline parameters are widely used and influence the wheelchair dimensions. With comprehensive wheelchair data available to the committee and the ADA access guidelines, we were able to estimate minimum cabin space and clearance requirements. Let me now turn my slides over to Gary. All right, thank you, Alan.
Okay, hopefully you can see my uh, screen. Alan, you may want to go on mute. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll cover uh, some of the aircraft uh, or some of the findings from the report and some of the key issues uh, that we addressed. The committee was able to conclude that the large majority of the, um, uh, of the airplanes have a main boarding door um, with sufficient width to enable a large majority of personal wheelchairs to pass through. So when we look at, I, I think it's important as I, if you read through the report as well as in this presentation, it's important to note that we have shown some or a concept here, um, and uh, but that it's only a concept and it's not the uh, it's not the only potential solution or the location for onboard wheelchairs. Um, this was a technical feasibility study, and the committee took the study as far as we could within the charge and the time frame that we were given for accomplishment. So there may be questions associated uh, with this as we go through it or in your mind. Um, and we're just showing some examples of, of what could be done here. About 83% of the uh, jet airline fleet in the United States have a boarding door width of at least 32 inches or greater. Um, when the, we looked at the wheelchair uh, data, the vast majority of wheelchairs had a 30 inch wide uh, maximum width up by the arms. So kind of the first key decision gate was, could we get wheelchairs into an aircraft? Um, about 93% of the aircraft in the US fleet had a, a boarding door width of at least 30 inches or greater. So this is a pretty significant percentage of aircraft that we could actually get a, uh, the vast majority of wheelchairs through onto the airplane. The committee ended up using um, sort of the 737, as you'll see here, as a proxy to evaluate the um, technical feasibility. Um, the 737 is kind of, and the, as uh, Alan said, the uh, A320 and the um, 737 are the most common families of airplanes uh, utilized in the, in the US fleet, and they have the majority of employments and deboarding. So we use those sort of as a proxy to evaluate it. Um, a securement area located near a door is likely to require the few, fewest changes to aisle widths and uh, other than a location, maybe that's deeper into the cabin because aisle widths in nearly all airplanes are too narrow for the vast majority of uh, personal wheelchairs to pass through. So looking at a, uh, at a location adjacent to a door really uh, minimizes um, the impact to modifications of the aircraft. We also looked at, you'll see in the following findings here, um, we've sort of assumed the, the front hand left door as the most common boarding door. Um, there are aircraft like the 757 and the A321, as well as wide body aircraft like the 777 that may board sometimes from the uh, second door on the left hand side known as the 2L door. Um, the concepts and thinking from the committee was that whichever door is being boarded um, or used in boarding in that aircraft would most likely be the door that you would want to put um, would be the most feasible to put a, a location next to. We did as well look at the aft of the airplane, um, looking at the 737 and the A320. Um, this is most often where their lavatories are located, um, just forward of the aftmost doors on the aircraft, and there would be significant challenges that would be required uh, trying to modify or remove lavatories um, to allow a, a wheelchair to pass um, and get into a securement area. When we look at um, the required space, um, as we're shown here, the removal of two successive rows of seats should provide sufficient room for a 30 by 60 inch clear space for the securement location. This as well would allow space to maneuver and use the essential wheelchair position functions in flight for pressure relief, recline uh, and such. So it also allows um, the wheelchair to maneuver laterally between the aisle and the securement space without requiring other changes to seating or aisle widths. One of the challenges obviously is from getting into the airplane and maneuvering between the entryway and the cabin aisle. So this entails the execution of a 90 degree turn. Um, and uh, you know, as mentioned, there are often airplane interior features that may intrude on these clear spaces. Um, there may be a closet, there may be a windscreen uh, just aft of the 1L or the boarding door. Um, these would need to be resized uh, or relocated to provide the needed space. 
Um, we also, you know, obviously just spoke about uh, the removal of two successive rows of seats near a boarding door. Um, we show here what would be a kind of all economy class or single uh, class configuration on a 737 is what is uh, shown here. However, um, in uh, a number of airlines uh, such as American, United, Delta, Alaska that do have first class seating, um, or domestic business class, depending on what you would call it, uh, up front, where it's two by two or, or doubles, you would still look to have to remove um, two rows of first class seats in those configurations as well uh, to make room or space for the 30 by uh, 60 inch clear space for the securement area. As described in the report, um, comprehensive testing data are available for common power wheelchair models. And this data uh, provides a reliable estimate that 850 pounds is the maximum occupied weight of a wheelchair that would need to be supported uh, by an airplane structure at the securement location. So we first figured out, okay, we think we can get the, air, the wheelchair in and we can get it to a position. Now, can the aircraft structure handle it? When we just did a, a simple analysis, looking at uh, two rows of economy class uh, triple seats, um, they can have a weight up to 1,200 pounds. This is, includes the six passengers that would be um, seated in those uh, two triples, as well as uh, the, the seat weight. The heaviest wheelchairs, as we said, don't exceed 850 pounds um, with occupants. So we have 1,200 pounds in two seats, and we only have 850 pounds in a wheelchair. So it suffice to say that there should not need to be um, you know, significant major structural modifications to an airplane to accommodate a wheelchair on board in that location. Um, in public testimony, both aircraft manufacturers and interior suppliers indicated that they did not feel the structural challenges were significant. One potential solution, again, I just say it's a potential solution shown here for load distribution is the use of a pallet. Um, pallets can be used to distribute the load more evenly into the aircraft floor structure. They're commonly used on uh, business and first class seats, as well as other furniture, um, such as business class social areas or bars. Um, they're lightweight uh, honeycomb panels and, uh, and are relatively common in the industry. The next thing we looked at was what standards were there in wheelchair design that could help align wheelchair safety uh, and aviation required seat and interior safety. So many wheelchairs, uh, personal wheelchairs comply with motor vehicle transportation safety and crash performance standard called WC19, which was established by the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society in North America, or RESNA. And this was very important. Um, WC19 compliant wheelchairs are designed um, to retain their form, stay upright, uh, with the restrained occupant in a seated position and retain their battery when subjected to a 20G uh, impact forces. So this is really kind of the three key pillars as well that when we look at um, FAA safety, which is, you know, handling a heavy G load, staying in one piece and retaining items of, uh, of mass. Um, the uh, WC-19 also accommodates a wheelchair anchor uh, pelvic safety belt that will stay in place and restrain the occupant during a frontal crash. The RESNA standards also provide for a widely available and standardized interface for an in-cabin wheelchair tie down and occupant restraint. So that was something else that the um, committee felt we needed to have or, or that would need to, um, to, to be in existence, which is sort of standardization between the wheelchair and its securement system. So WC-19 um, compliant wheelchairs provide for four standardized uh, points um, with uh, slot type geometries for attaching tie downs. The committee is aware of other systems um, out there for in vehicle securement, but the four point system is currently the most common uh, and versatile. So that was one of the ones that we, we took a serious look at. More work um, is certainly needed to understand how secured personal wheelchairs are likely to perform relative to, um, to certain FAA safety criteria. The committee could not know how the FAA would treat secured wheelchairs in terms of requiring strict compliance with all crashworthiness criteria, and therefore assume for its analysis that compliant with existing FAA crashworthiness criteria would be required. 
side-by-side -side comparisons of FAA crashworthiness criteria for airplane seats and cabin interiors and criteria developed by Resna for the crashworthiness of wheelchairs uh, in motor vehicle transportation was incredibly complicated and complex because each was established for different operating crash environments. However, the committee was able to determine more work is needed to understand in particular how secured personal wheelchairs are likely to perform relative to certain FAA safety criteria in restraining and protecting the occupants during a survivable aircraft airplane crash or emergency landing. What we're showing here um, on the right hand side are two of the FAA uh, dynamic crash tests. There's the forward 16G test shown on the on the lower side. And there's also a vertical component test where there's a vertical um, the dynamic crash. Um, the Resna WC19 wheelchairs did not go through a uh, vertical crash. So that's uh, an area of, uh, of more research required. Um, Resna performance, um, you know, crash performance for wheelchairs, you know, it does have some similarities, as I mentioned, with one of the two FAA dynamic tests, um, you know, requires the FAA's horizontal test requires the airplane seat to demonstrate the ability to avoid um, severe deformation, retain items of mass and protect the occupant from uh, severe head and leg injuries in a 16G peak dynamic crash. Um, Resna wheelchairs basically have to demonstrate crash worthiness, occupant restraint, um, and component retention in a front uh, frontal motor vehicle crash occurring at 30 miles per hour. It's effectively an average loading of, of 20 Gs. However, as I said, the Resna standard does not include a test condition comparable to the FAA's second dynamic crash test in which the impact vector uh, is vertical. Um, the FAA also does a significant amount of more measurement uh, in injury criteria, looking at things like femur loading and lumbar loading and head injury criteria, um, which isn't um, currently as, uh, as, as measured in WC19. And Resna flammability, Resna does have flammability testing standards, but they do differ from the FAA standards for airline seats. What was important um, is that despite the differences in the FAA criteria and Resna standards, the Resna standards do establish a baseline minimum level of crash and safety performance that many commonly used wheelchairs comply with today and that more wheelchairs could be designed to comply with in the future. Uh, the circumstance potentially facilitates future conformance to FAA safety criteria. If WC19 and other Resna standards did not exist to provide a common baseline, um, the job of evaluating a heterogeneous population of wheelchairs for compliance with FAA criteria could be technically daunting and potentially impractical and would have made our job in the committee uh, much more difficult. The committee did not identify any issues from the information available to us that seem likely to present um, challenges so formidable that they call into question the technical feasibility of in-cabin wheelchair securement systems. It warrants mentioning that while the committee focused its analysis on the two common families of narrow bodies, the 737 and the A320, um, and that you know, our assessment indicated that it would be both manageable and practical, this focus should not be interpreted as a determination by the committee that wheelchair securements would be technically infeasible on other aircraft, including the vast majority of regional jets have doors um, that would uh, accommodate a, uh, the entry of a wheelchair. Wide body aircraft, the 767, the A330, the 777 have much larger cabins and larger doors uh, usually. Um, one of the key findings we had as well, that there were several important airline operational and passenger accommodation issues that would need additional attention, including things such as fare reservation system capabilities, procedures for validating that wheelchairs are eligible to board and continue to be airworthy over time, assuming that's what the FAA would require. Um, airlines would need the ability to ensure that passengers with significant disabilities traveling in the wheelchairs don't, do not become stranded on route. Um, such as during a connecting service. So again, going back to kind of the level of service, the amount of the fleet um, that may need to be modified to include a wheelchair securement location. Um, other things such as, uh, you know, protocols for power management and controlling the seating functions in flight. That's very important for passengers with reduced mobility that may need to do pressure relief during a long flight. While these and several other important operational accommodation issues are noted in the report, 
a more thorough treatment of them would be premature at this early stage when an in-cabin wheelchair securement system remains just a concept and there is limited information available for assessing important factors such as demand and use characteristics. To the extent which, um, to which the assurance of reliable and sufficiently available securement systems on airplanes could create operational and accommodation challenges would really depend in part on the demand. So passenger demand is not known. It's difficult to gauge at this point because it would presumably depend in large part on whether people who do not fly now because of difficulty sitting in and transferring to and from airplane seats uh, would be willing to fly if they could remain in their own personal wheelchair. We also have passenger man demand that may depend on interest from people who uh, are non-ambulatory but fly occasionally, um, but now may fly uh, more often if they did not face the risks and difficulties with the seat transfers or worrying about their personal wheelchairs being lost or damaged uh, when, in, when checked in. So assessing the demand for in-cabin wheelchair service is therefore a complicated but potentially critical step for making decisions about equipping airplanes with wheelchair securements and understanding and addressing ensuing operational and accommodation needs. So with that, Alan, I will uh, turn it back over to you. Thanks, Gary. I'm gonna uh, share my slides again. Can people see my slides now? Yes, we can. Okay. As Gary emphasized in presenting the results of our committee's work, there are some information gaps that would need to be filled in order to move beyond the conceptual stage of wheelchair securement systems for airlines. So the committee came up with two major recommendations. The first one was in order to address the information gaps, we think the US Department of Transportation as well as the Federal Aviation Administration needs to establish a program of research. And we believe this research should be done in collaboration with RESNA, of course, the Rehab Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, as well as the assistive technology industry. And we think this research should focus on testing and evaluating an appropriate selection of wheelchair 19 compliant wheelchairs in accordance with applicable FAA crashworthiness and safety performance criteria. Gary identified some of the gaps when one looks at surface transportation versus airline transportation. And so our first recommendation is that we think this kind of research would need to be done to fully address some of the safety issues. We think the program should look at, but not be limited to assessing the performance of WC-19 wheelchairs that are secured in an airplane cabin during a survivable crash an emergency landing, as well as severe turbulence. Can, um, is my uh, screen being shown? It is not, Alan, thank you. Now it is, Alan. We can see it now. Okay, thanks, Gary. So we think the program of research should look at the performance of WC-19 wheelchairs that are secured in an airplane cabin, both in a survivable crash, emergency landing, and severe turbulence by maintaining their form, restraining their occupants, and protecting them from injury. Also, the research should look at retaining batteries and other items of mass and provide adequate fire resistance. We think the research should be conducted in order to inform future decisions that may need, may need to be made by the U.S. Department of Transportation, as well as the FAA in response to petitions and other requests by RESNA and other assistive technology industry members to identify opportunities to align existing wheelchair transportation safety standards with performance criteria required for airplanes, as well as the airline and aircraft industries so that they can more fully understand the implications of 
as well as the opportunities for providing travelers with the ability to remain seated in their personal wheelchairs when flying. We also think to address some of the concerns that Gary raised in our findings about the gaps of information about travelers, that the US Access Board should sponsor studies that assess the likely demand for air travel by people who are non-ambulatory if they could remain seated in their personal wheelchairs. We think this type of research would help better define the space needed in the airplane cabin for wheelchair maneuvering and securement. It would provide insight into passenger support as well as surface service assistance requirements and inform the airline decisions about needed levels of fleet coverage and flight availability. So those are our two major recommendations. In terms of next steps, we think that future research, testing and evaluation would be informed by the recommended research and it needs to be planned and programmed in accordance with a high level roadmap that would define and prioritize the technical and other decisions that would need to be made in order to move this concept forward. Example of some of the issues in the roadmap would include the following. Identifying priorities for furthering wheelchair engineering and design activities. Identifying areas for new regulation development. Ensuring that wheelchairs brought on board an airplane cabin are kept crashworthy, understanding the training requirements for airline personnel, understanding likely travel experience of passengers using these securement systems if they were put in place, testing and simulations to confirm the actual amount of cabin space required, and understanding the implications of wheelchair securements for airplanes on airline operations and their um, economies. The committee felt that the U.S. Department of Transportation would be the logical lead for developing such a strategic roadmap to move forward in collaboration with other agencies and entities identified in our recommendations in our report, with consultation and input from a wide range of interest and experts, including, including the airlines and their passenger service personnel, airframe manufacturers and interior component suppliers, people with disabilities, their advocates, and the assistive technology industry. I'm going to stop now, and we're going to open the um, session for questions that Gary, I, and the other members of the committee who are with us today will try to answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alan and Gary, for that uh, presentation. I'll now uh, be presenting some questions that have been posed by uh, participants today. Um, first question, is the report available for individual review by members of the public? I can take that one and note that uh, on the uh, Access Board's website, uh, on our webpage that specifically devoted to this study, uh, you can find the 508 compliant version of the report. So if you go to uh, www.access-board.gov forward slash aircraft, uh, that's the page where you'll be able to uh, get to the link of the study. Uh, the direct link to the report is also in the Q&A broadcast under answered questions. Um, so I think we move on to the next question. Uh, will the recording of the presentation be available to the public? They were unable to attend today. I can also take that one and state that yes, uh, on the Access Board website, um, on the same page uh, that I just referenced for the report link, there will also be a link to the recording of this session. Um, the next question, uh, will you be sharing the slides from today's presentation uh, with individuals that are attending? Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you, Gary, if uh, 
that's something that the committee has considered doing, again, specifically allowing access uh, to the slides. Um, Mario, let me Mario, just, let me... that the committee would be very fine with providing the slides to anyone who would be interested. Great, thank you. Okay, now we'll move on to some of the more substantive questions that have come up. Um, and this, again, I leave it to Alan, Gary, Miriam, and Naomi, uh, whichever ever of you wants to answer. Uh, during the course of your uh, conducting the study, did you uh, receive input from individuals that use a wheelchair daily and that have uh, tried flying uh, in the past 10 years? Yeah, I can answer that, that question, Mario. During the work of the committee, we heard from numerous individuals as well as advocates who use wheelchairs on a regular basis. We also had members of the committee themselves who are regular wheelchair users, both manual and power wheelchairs. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Alan. Um, the next question, uh, was any consideration given to providing wheelchair users that might be accommodated on aircraft using securement system with access to aircraft lavatories? Uh, my understanding is that uh, that was not an issue uh, that was in the charge or, or that the committee addressed, but uh, Alan, anything you wanna say on, on that point? Yeah, Matt, Mario, you're absolutely correct. The, um, the issue around laboratories in airplanes is currently an issue, and it would be an issue for wheelchairs using a securement system. The committee, of course, discussed it, and people who presented to us shared their experiences, but it was outside of our charge, so we did not develop findings or recommendations related to laboratories. Great, thank you, Alan. Uh, next, we received multiple questions about whether the study committee uh, looked into the issue of accommodating more than one wheelchair user on a flight. Um, uh, and one related question to that, um, was any consideration given to having wheelchairs using securement systems facing the aisle so that you might be able to have potentially uh, two secured wheelchairs rather than just one? Yeah, that, those are good questions. The, the committee focused on the minimum requirements that would be needed to secure one wheelchair on an airplane, knowing full well that there could be more than one and that issue would need to be addressed in the future. But we did not spe specifically address or make recommendations regarding more than that. Great, thank you. Uh, next is a question that I believe Gary touched on, but we may wanna expand the answer a little bit further if possible. Uh, and that is uh, speaking to wheelchair users that need to regularly tilt and recline in their power wheelchairs for pressure relief, um, can, can that be accommodated? Alan, if you want me to take that, uh, thank you, Mario. Yeah, that was looking at the 30 by 60 inch uh, ADA uh, kind of footprint, uh, it was determined by looking by the committee and some of the data that we had that um, that 30 by 60 inch space uh, should be able to accommodate um, the tilt and, and, you know, maybe leg rest movement functions that would be required um, for pressure relief by wheelchair users. Great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next, I think this is another, uh, another good question. Uh, does the securement area include seating for caregivers or family members? So I guess the question to the presenters would be, uh, was that an issue that you looked at, basically having uh, companion seating uh, reserved or devoted you know, uh, to the uh, 
to the wheelchair user that, that might be secured in the cabin. Gary, you want to take that one? Sure, I can. Um, it, it was discussed, and I think, as we say, it was discussed a number of times during our our committee meetings. Um, and you know, I think, as Alan said, we were our charge was really to say, is it technically feasible to put a wheelchair, have an in in cabin wheelchair? Um, you know, space and could you get a wheelchair in and out uh, and and strap it down and, you know, didn't need to completely redesign, you know, an aircraft structure and door. So we initially sort of limited ourselves to that. Um, I would say that we have seen, um, you know, there were even some other, I think, some presentations by some of the interior suppliers that came and were showing a variety of different potential um, designs. So, uh, you know, the from a feasibility standpoint, we didn't uh, explicitly consider it, um, but that certainly doesn't rule out that uh, the interior industry and the aircraft manufacturer industry uh, won't come up with alternate solutions that uh, that may uh, include that, um, you know, that that configuration to allow that. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, next question. Uh, as we all know, there's a separation between the floor of the uh, of the jetway and the floor of the plane. Uh, was that an issue that the committee looked at, and how you provide uh, that access over that uh, vertical differential from the jetway uh, into the aircraft? Gary, you want to take that one too? Yep, I'm happy to. Um, so it was discussed as well, um, you know, what may need to happen to get wheelchairs into the aircraft, looking at that 30 inch space. We also had, if you um, go into the report, used about a 26 inch wheelbase for the wheelchair. Um, and looking at some of the curvature, uh, aircraft doors are not square. They're rounded edges really for stress relief ar around them because they're pressure vessels and everything else. Um, there is, a, so it was considered, it was not um, identified as a, you know, key um, technical issue that would make it infeasible to get wheelchairs in and out. Ideally, the jetway should be even with the floor of the aircraft. Um, you know, there was discussion during some of the committee meetings on whether a ramp would be required, uh, maybe to get up and over a small lip. Um, but again, this would be something that should not be a, a technical challenge and would be something maybe kept on the jetway and used when required. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. Um, another one on uh, individuals that use power wheelchairs that might need to charge their wheelchairs during flight. Um, was that an issue that the committee looked at? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting issue. And to my recollection, the committee did not discuss that issue at any length. I don't know if any other members, Naomi or Miriam, you want to speak to that. I don't recall any real committee discussion on charging batteries during flight. I don't know if Miriam remembers anything. Uh, I do not remember that specific discussion, although we, of course, discussed so many things. And we did discuss the safety of having uh, the batteries uh, or the wheelchairs on in order to operate the reclining functions. So we, whenever we were discussing batteries, we were emphasizing the need to meet the safety requirements while flying. So I think it's a good thing to think about though. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Naomi. Great, uh, next question. Uh, this is a, a question pertaining to users of manual wheelchairs. Uh, would the securement systems uh, contemplated by the study committee be able to accommodate users of manual wheelchairs? And if so, how? Miriam, would you like to address that one? Um, uh, yes, the um, securement or the WC-19, which was our um, guideline for thinking about securing wheelchairs, 
um, does apply to manual wheelchairs as well as power wheelchairs and even scooters. Um, so anything that um, is amenable to being secured in a motor vehicle um, was what we were thinking about when we were making these recommendations. Great, thank you, Miriam. And I, I think this next question might also uh, be in your wheelhouse, but let me read it. Uh, the, the questioner asked, uh, it is important to understand that WC19 only requires wheelchair securement by a four point strap system and that very few wheelchairs in use today include uh, a wheelchair anchored crash worthy lap belt. Was that an issue that was uh, looked at by the committee? We did talk about the, so um, just to clarify, WC19 does require that every compliant wheelchair offer the option of a crash worthy wheelchair anchored lap belt. Um, and right now we have few people in the field who are actually um, choosing that option. Um, but it was, especially when we think about um, safety on the aircraft, um, the wheelchair anchored lap belt obviously offers a similar occupant protection system to that of the other um, passengers on the aircraft and is a nice feature because it offers a good fit to the um, wheelchair user and um, it doesn't require um, the nece necessity to maybe uh, maneuver to uh, reach or use a re occupant restraint system that's provided on the, on the airplane. So um, yes, it is the case that we would have to do education and get the word out about these features, but um, we are glad that all of that background work for, for WC19 is in place so that that could happen. Great, thank you, Miriam. Um, next, a couple more questions that I think I can take. Um, are you planning to share your report with companies that make airplanes? Uh, so the report now as of last Wednesday, September 15th uh, is publicly available. Uh, as I've noted, the 508 compliant version of the report is available uh, on our website uh, at access-board.gov forward slash aircraft. And so um, again, we, we would encourage uh, all relevant parties uh, to freely access uh, the report and use it in uh, developing next steps that they may want to take. I should also note that uh, Boeing and Airbus were two uh, airline manufacturers that presented directly to the, uh, to the study committee um, at, uh, at one of the open meetings um, early on in the process. And I believe their input was solicited by the committee members uh, throughout the course of their study. Um, another questioner uh, references the uh, uh, important work that uh, the organization All Wheels Up has uh, done in uh, uh, having some, uh, and advocating on this issue and having uh, some crash testing conducted um, that it has sponsored. Um, so the question really is, was the organization consulted in the course of this study? I can also state that uh, at the first open meeting, uh, uh, Michelle Irwin, the founder and leader of All Wheels Up, uh, did present to the uh, study committee. And um, I think uh, we at the Access Board um, acknowledged that uh, it, it's a very important organization that has uh, kind of brought a spotlight on this issue. So we appreciate the work that All Wheels Up uh, and other entities like the Paralyzed Veterans of America uh, and other advocacy groups have done in uh, raising awareness about this issue. Okay, now we'll return to some- Mario. Yes. Uh, Naomi might want to elaborate on that, or I'm sorry, Miriam may want to elaborate on that. Right. Um, so certainly the All Wheels Up uh, foundational work um, is was very um, informative to the committee and um, definitely inspired uh, our confidence that there's a lot of potential going forward for a viable solution. Um, I think that a lot of the recommendations of the future research 
would um, build on those ideas and um, the momentum that All Wheels Up has um, initiated. Great, thank you, Miriam, for that additional insight. Um, so the next question turns to uh, what happens in the event uh, of a crash? Uh, what factors did the study committee consider or look at uh, when evaluating uh, individuals who might be secured in their uh, wheelchairs uh, using the securement area that was discussed, uh, the likelihood of survivability of a crash and um, the, the implications uh, of that for that passenger as well as other passengers seated in locations nearby the secured wheelchair. Miriam, do you want to start sure. in addressing that question? And then Gary may want to add to it. Um, yes. Yeah, so what the philosophy that sort of has driven developing crashworthiness standards for wheelchairs and really led a lot of our thinking in this committee is the idea that we're trying to provide an equal level of protection for all of the users on the, on the plane, all of the people who are riding on the plane. Now, we all know that transportation does come with some risks, um, that people are, people are routinely injured um, during transportation. So it isn't likely that we'd be able to eliminate all potential for injury for people who are in wheelchairs, but we really want to aim for an equivalent um, situation. The um, many of the uh, principles that developed the guidance for WC19 are, dr are drawn directly from the motor vehicle safety standards. And so again, looking for that equivalent level of protection. So a lot of our work here looked at comparing what we're doing for WC19 crash testing and what they do in the FAA. And I think that the next logical step would be to um, do an assessment of, of what injury parameters are being evaluated by FAA and their testing and try to make sure that those are addressed um, for wheelchairs used as seating. In terms of people around the wheelchair station or the, or the wheelchair seated passenger, um, the biggest threat to them are um, things that might come off the wheelchair, which already is addressed in our standards, and then also sharp edges or unfriendly um, surfaces that could be contacted during a crash. Um, a lot of that is um, addressed with clear space, um, just making sure that, that contact can't happen, but we can also address that with padding. And the uh, FAA standards actually have a uh, head impact or the HIC criteria for the person behind contacting a forward um, vehicle feature. So the, all of these things would be considered um, going forward to try to um, create a, a situation that's as safe as, as possible and, and equivalent to the other um, passengers on the plane. And I, I will add that that additional testing was emphasized in our first recommendation yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that briefly, Alan, I think as well. Um, and I think we actually asked a specific question to the access board after the first meeting, which was looking at kind of an equivalent level of safety. Are we, you know, are we considering egress? Do we have to get the wheelchair, you know, off the airplane? And um, just to be clear, that was not in the charge of the committee. Um, so we were not looking at, I think, because uh, we did discuss that in a number of different meetings of whether, you know, um, getting the wheelchair off the airplane with the passenger in it. I think it was uh, basically, I think the access board um, in their direction to us as sponsor indicated that in the event of a crash, um, a, a uh, wheelchair passenger um, would be evacuated the same way uh, they're evacuated today if they were sitting in, a, in an aircraft seat. So it was not, we didn't have to consider that we were going to get the wheelchair out the airplane and down a slide. Great. Thank you all for answering that. Um, in looking at this issue, um, did the committee uh, determine that rows of aircraft seats would have to be permanently removed um, or would only be, uh, or would be, would be a situation where they'd be able to be uh, removed for when there is a passenger using a wheelchair and put back in 
the aircraft uh, for other passengers. Alan, you want me to take right, that one? Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. So it's a very good question. Um, again, going back to our charge, which was looking at the technical feasibility of um, of getting wheelchairs in. I, I've got, you know, my background is, is aircraft design and interiors and interior design and modifications. I've got 30, over 30 years in the industry. I will say this, the airlines and the interior manufacturers, including the OEMs, the airframe OEMs, Boeing, Airbus, and Braer, um, are, are incredibly adept um, at coming up with uh, new and um, unique ideas that we can't even think of today, um, even in, in our concept development and discussions uh, in, the, uh, in the meetings that we had and the discussions we had and discussions with the suppliers themselves. So uh, again, we, I don't know that we know 100% the answer. Um, you know, would it be permanent? Would it be removable? We talked about both in, in our meeting. Again, our charge was just to say, is it technically feasible? Um, but uh, from a, a personal perspective, I would not be surprised to um, have the industry, if, the, if this moves forward, to have the industry come up with some really unique uh, designs that are flexible, um, depending on what's required um, in the operation by the airlines and in the aircraft. Great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next question. And I think this is something that uh, Alan and Gary addressed uh, during the presentation. Um, you know, the question is for wheelchair securement, were there other options that were evaluated besides uh, a four point tie down uh, system? I, I believe, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that the response to that is. Just because the committee identified a four-point tie-down option uh, for wheelchair securement, that, that, that does not preclude uh, any other type of potential design that uh, might be able to be come up with uh, to address the issue. That's correct, Mario. But I'll also ask Miriam to elaborate on that because this is clearly within her wheelhouse. Um, yes, yeah, so right now in... Um, motor vehicle transportation, we see four point strap type tie downs, but also docking systems, um, commercial docking systems that grab onto the bottom of the chair. And there's also some um, design concepts for universal docking where the chair is docked um, from behind. So all of those were presented to and discussed with the committee. Um, and certainly any of those could be a, a way forward for um, securing wheelchairs. I think that the our focus was, you know, was it feasible? And certainly we've seen successful results in motor vehicles for all three types, styles of wheelchair securement. And so it just remains to be seen what would work um, for the FAA requirements. Great, thank you, uh, Miriam. I think another question that uh, would go to you, which I will uh, read now, uh, it talks about uh, not the securement of the wheelchair to the cabin floor, but rather uh, the restraint of the occupant of the wheelchair. Uh, so the question is what type of uh, restraint uh, systems will there be for wheelchair occupants during flight? Um, and are, are, would there be any uh, restraint systems that would not only be attached to the wheelchair, but also uh, potentially to the aircraft frame? So obviously, um, as we see in vehicles, there are solutions both that um, have a lap belt attached and anchored to the wheelchair, a crash where the lap belt anchored to the wheelchair, and also systems that are completely anchored to the vehicle. Um, I think that the attraction of, um, of the wheelchair anchored lap belt for, the, for this application is that it does not require um, the seat belt to be um, maneuvered or threaded through um, wheelchair features. It also would be, uh, the one on the wheelchair would be have a customized fit for that person um, and be something that was they were comfortable using. Um, uh, certainly there are solutions that, um, that could involve a aircraft anchored lap belt. Um, I think that that does complicate uh, the, the discussion that we're having about pallets and um, how to make sure that 
that um, these systems are well secured, but it's a blank slate at this point, so. Great, thank you for that, Miriam. Um, another question uh, has come in regarding uh, existing aisles uh, on the aircraft that are predominantly used in the US fleet. Um, specifically, are the existing aisles able to accommodate uh, wheelchairs needing to maneuver uh, to the wheelchair securement space? I think uh, based on my knowledge, right, most aircraft aisles um, are in the neighborhood of 15 to 17 inches wide. Uh, so that the, really what the committee looked at was the option of having a, a, a power wheelchair enter um, the cabin and uh, be able to go right kind of to the very front uh, seating area, uh, as opposed to having to travel through the aisle, which would probably not be uh, feasible. But uh, Gary, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct, Mario. Um, again, it's a this was looking at what was feasible from a conceptual standpoint. So whatever door is used for boarding, um, it would make the most sense to minimize the impact on the aircraft uh, and the interior design to try to have the securement um, the securement location uh, at that you know adjacent to that uh, entry boarding door. Um, you know, could the industry come up with with other um, other options? There's, you know, things called variable geometry seats that were uh, popular in the 90s where a seat during boarding, you know, can can uh, change width and, you know, may potentially get you down the aisle. But again, that's just adding kind of more complexity and cost. Um, so but um you know, so that's why we were looking at, um, from a feasibility standpoint, um, at least the from what we can um, uh, propose at this point, or suppose, I guess probably at this point would be that the location would be adjacent to uh, whichever door is used for boarding that wheelchair. That's not to preclude that it could never happen. It would just need it would just uh, incur, you know, significantly more, um, you know, uh, effort in, in engineering to design the solution. But you are correct, Mario, and that the minimum um, aisle width uh, uh, required or allowed by the FAA, the aisle can be as as uh, th as small as 15 inches wide, which the vast majority of wheelchairs, their wheelbase won't fit through. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, so the WC-19 has been referenced multiple times today and throughout the report, of course. Uh, for individuals, uh, particularly those that might be uh, visiting the U.S. from other countries that might not have uh, a WC-19 compliant wheelchair, is there any equivalent global standard uh, similar to the WC-19 that could potentially allow uh, users of non WC-19 chairs uh, to use securement systems? I can answer this. It's a one good question, time. Mario. And it's not one that we discussed uh, at great length in the committee. But this again is in Miriam's wheelhouse. So I'll ask her to elaborate on that. Um, yes, there are um, similar standards developed in ISO, the International Standards Organization, that um, have a similar intent to the wheelchair transportation standards for RESNA. Uh, the one that's most similar to RESNA WC19 is ISO 7176 Part 19. It is similar, but is not identical. It allows a wheelchair anchored crash worthy lap belt, but it does not require one. Um, to be provided as an option like we have in WC-19. So that's a po an important distinction. But in terms of uh, crash worthiness, um, there is something out there um, that is a global standard. I'm sorry, this is Rosemary Access Board staff. And I have a note in the chat that captioning is not writing. So uh, Lauren, captioner Lauren. Lauren, come in. Hi, yes, I'm here. Um, I've been writing, so I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but uh, let me get on that real quick and see if I can figure out why you're not seeing it. Uh, 
Okay. Well, if, if for what it's worth, your audio is choppy. Maybe that's why. Test, test, one, two, one, two. Test, test, one, two, one, two. Your audio was fine, Rose. Okay. I was, I was waiting for a captioner to catch up with me, but I'm still not seeing it. I apologize for this. Um, so uh, I know that we do have the uh, interpreter, Jolinda, interpreting for us now. Um, should we uh, proceed and allow Jolinda to interpret? Um, Negative, no. No, okay, great. So we'll try to get the captioner on the line then. Um, Okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Timothy. Lauren, Lauren, Captioner Lauren, come in. So Lauren, are you hearing our audio? Hey, yes, I can hear you. And I am there on my side, everything is still connected. So I'm not understanding why they stopped showing up in Zoom. So that's what I'm still currently trying to figure out. I'm gonna reconnect a new link and see if that fixes it. Thank you. So Lauren, were you going to log off and log back in again? Because we still see you as active. I'm just at the moment re-inputting the API token into the um, current captioning link to see why it is no longer linked to Zoom. I want to remove it from cart and put it back on all settings. Yes, thank you, Edson. And everybody, please stand by.
And this is Rosemary again, just I apologize for the delay. We are waiting on a caption, captioner. So please stay on. Good afternoon, everybody. Check one, check two. This is Rosemary Access Board, Washington, DC. Captioner, I saw a brief snippet. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what has happened with the API token, but I have changed everything to wrap directly into Zoom. It's just a different way to do it. So hopefully now you'll be able to see it. I'll just have to punch it through. So just let me know if there's another problem. Fabulous. Uh, again, just just test the system real quick. Rosemary Access Board, Washington, DC. And we are good. Thank you very much, everybody. Mario, back to you. Fabulous. Uh, again, just just Test the system real quick. There's my access board, Washington, D.C., and we are good. Thank you very much, everybody. Mario? Yes. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. your patience. We appreciate that. Um, uh, the next question uh, Did the committee consider uh, wheelchair users who travel uh, accompanied by uh, service dogs? And uh, specifically the question of space uh, for uh, a service dog uh, next to the occupied wheelchair. Yes. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We appreciate that. Um, Mario, um, to my recollection, the committee did not directly address the use of service dogs. Our focus was on the individual in the wheelchair and the securement system and its potential technical feasibility. And so we did not really focus on service dogs, um, accompanied uh, passengers, and so forth. OK. Thank you, Alan. Um, so this next question uh, relates to uh, evacuation, uh, specifically if the wheelchair were secured uh, near the front of the aircraft, uh, would there be an issue with it uh, potentially creating an obstacle to the exit, um, allowing other passengers to evacuate? Alan, if you want me to take that one. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, no. So um, that was one of the key things we looked at was, um, you know, not having a detrimental safety effect or a negative safety effect on any of the existing passengers. So the securement system um, and the location would be designed uh, such that the, even in, a, uh, in an incident or crash, um, the wheelchair would have to remain, you know, um, attached to the securement location and the securement location where it is. So that all goes into the testing to um, evaluate that um, during a, a crash, there is uh, the wheelchair doesn't separate and become a blockage either to the aisle um, or to a, an exit. So that definitely was a part of the consideration. Great. Thank you. Um, so now uh, I'll address uh, numerous questions have come in um, where there seems to be uh, an assumption that uh, the concept for wheelchair securement will definitely be implemented uh, in the US fleet. Uh, I'll start by saying that um, at this point, uh, this was simply a technical feasibility study. Uh, the committee has laid out its conclusions in the report and importantly noted recommendations for additional research that need to be done. Uh, so uh, the subtitle to this report is a preliminary assessment. And I think that's the uh, takeaway uh, that we should all have from this, that uh, this is uh, an extremely complicated issue with a lot of moving parts. Uh, 
Congress called for a study. Uh, the Access Board sponsored the study uh, and TRB carried it out. Um, and so the preliminary assessment that uh, the committee come up, came up with uh, is something, again, that would, would need to be worked on further uh, before this concept could be implemented across the, uh, across the fleet. So uh, Alan and Gary, anything else you wanna to add to that? Mario, I, I think you've answered the question uh, extremely well. Our focus is, was on, could it be technically feasible? It was not on, should this be done going forward? And we did raise the issues that we think would need to be studied further in order to move the concept forward. But the committee did not take a stand on whether or not this should be implemented. That was not in our charge. Great, thank you, Alan. Um, so the next question, um, and this you know, presumes that uh, the additional research uh, would be done and there might be uh, additional uh, support for, uh, or I guess statements uh, 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 saying that this would be possible to be done. Uh, if that were the case, does the committee, or does the committee have any uh, comment on the projected timeline that it would uh, that would be for actually getting uh, such a concept in place if it were ultimately uh, able to be done. Uh... Mario, the committee did not speak to the issue of, of a timeline. Our recommendations were that the Department of Transportation should develop a roadmap and that Congress would need to get involved in securing the resources to, to conduct the types of additional research and data uh, collection that we've identified in our recommendations. Those issues would really affect any future timetable. So we did not speak to that at all. Very well, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, so to what extent were the manufacturers of wheelchairs and occupant restraint systems for wheelchairs uh, to, to what extent were they uh, involved in the process? Miriam, 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 would you address that issue, please? Certainly. So um, in our meetings, we had both um, uh, public meetings and closed door meetings and um, wheelchair manufacturers, particularly, I think three of the large U.S. manufacturers did um, present to us about what they saw as challenges and opportunities with using a wheelchair as a seat in, um, in an aircraft. Obviously, wheelchair manufacturers are key stakeholders and key partners in getting this, if this process were to move forward. So um, they definitely would need to be included um, in any efforts going forward to make sure that um, just as we think of, of a wheelchair is an extension of the person who's using it. It needs to not only be a seat in a transportation vehicle, but it also needs to meet all of their needs in terms of activities of daily living. And we need to look at how um, how wheelchairs might be possible to to meet this this entire spectrum of um, needs effectively. Great, thank you. Uh, next question: Was the National Institute for Aviation Research? in Kansas consulted in the course of the study. Gary, could you speak to that? I don't recall that organization. Do you, perchance? No, I don't recall um, them coming and speaking. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, were the costs of implementation studied? I believe that there is a section in the report uh, on uh, potential costs, um, but uh, Gary, did you wanna expand a little bit about, uh, uh, on that question? Yeah, our charge was not to look at specifically, um, you know, what would this cost the industry? What would it cost to implement? So much of it is gonna end up depending on what's the cost, you know, what is the design and the concept um, that the industry comes up with to do it. 
Um, we did, you know, it was a lot of discussion uh, internally within the committee about how to address this because revenue and cost impacts are, you know, such a huge part of this, yet they were outside the charge um, of our, in general, they were outside the specifications of our charge. Obviously, you know, if we were going to have to increase the size of the door um, or structurally reinforce, you know, the entire fuselage of the aircraft, you can't ignore, um, you know, the financing uh, of that uh, or the financials associated with that. But um, we did include some really rough order magnitude ranges um, of some of the I would say excluding the wheelchair tie down or the securement system itself, uh, what some of the costs might be from a uh, capital investment standpoint. We didn't address revenue from an airline's perspective, but just the cost to you know modify uh, the aircraft. There are some ranges given in there for the type of um, of uh, concept solution that's shown um, in the in the report. And so things like um, relocation of closets, uh, any changes to IFE systems, uh, and things like that, right, Gary? Yes, correct. Those are the type of things that were um, that were included in the report. Great, thank you. Um, the next question: Where can I find a list of the committee members along with uh, their expertise? So I can note that the uh, report uh, includes uh, an appendix, I believe, that has the uh, bios of all uh, members of the committee. Um, and that information is also on the website, on the webpage for this study uh, that's hosted by the Transportation Research Board. They also have the full committee roster with the bios of the members there. Um, that is correct, Mario. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, given that there are different technologies for both wheelchair and air and airline uh, and securement systems, is the committee making recommendations for what would define common power wheelchair and securement systems? And I think uh, I'll take a stab at answering that uh, to note that no, the committee uh, is not making recommendations for what would define uh, power wheelchair securement systems on aircraft. Uh, it looked at a, you know, a, a concept uh, and gave its preliminary assessment on technical feasibility. Um, anything else you want to add, Alan or Gary? Or? I'm thinking Miriam might want to add to that. Um, I think that the big, uh, the, the next step in this process of, of trying to think of what sort of wheelchair securement systems we should use on an airplane is really falls with seeing what systems um, perform well in the FAA testing. Um, once we know whether any of our current um, systems um, can perform well and provide that equivalent level of um, securement that we're after, then we can start to think about, do we need, can we use pick one? Could we have, you know, two different choices or does it have to be something new entirely? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, next question, what was the legislation that called for this study? I can answer that. Uh, Section 432 of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 uh, was the operative language uh, that directed the Access Board to conduct the study. Um, in turn, the Access Board uh, uh, contracted with the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine to carry out the study uh, as required by Congress. So the report has been uh, issued publicly and um, the members of the study committee uh, have briefed um, members of Congress and their staff uh, on the results of the study. Uh, next question, um, and I think this is something that, that's been addressed already. Um, you know, if a wheelchair user uh, was in their device and it were secured to the aircraft cabin, uh, how would they get to the lavatory? 
And I think that is something that uh, the study committee did not look at. Uh, there are other efforts uh, that are, are underway looking at that issue uh, uh, the, that are under the auspices of the Department of Transportation. Um, in terms of the general question of laboratory access uh, for wheelchair users. Uh, but again, I believe that uh, the committee in this instance did not look at uh, how occupants of wheelchairs secured in the cabin uh, would be able to use the laboratory or if they could. That's correct, Mario, just as you answered. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, were there any particular issues noted that by the study committee uh, that they noted would be extremely difficult to overcome? Or are all of the issues uh, possible to solve with further research and minor changes? Again, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, the committee looked at uh, a variety of issues uh, with the time and resources that it had and uh, concluded based on its preliminary assessment of those factors uh, that there were not necessarily any issues or obstacles so insurmountable to uh, render this uh, effort or concept uh, impossible. Uh, but I'll leave it to the presenters to add on to that uh, if they like. Again, you're correct, Mario, and, and Gary focused on this in the first conclusion that he articulated of the committee. We did not identify any issues from the information currently available that would appear to present design or engineering challenges so formidable that it would call into question the technical feasibility of such securement systems. So that is clearly one of our conclusions. Thank you. Next question. Will wheelchair manufacturers now follow additional RESNA standards so that every wheelchair will be able to fly? Let me ask Miriam to address that. Um, well, certainly we would want to, um, as, as a you, as a previous question mentioned, um, wheelchair manufacturers are a really important stakeholder in this. Um, we need to back up and make sure we know exactly what performance criteria and features wheelchairs need to have um, to, to perform this task. Um, and then hopefully um, a, a, a step past that would be um, making sure that these are products that are available. Um, hopefully the um, the promise that we see with the foundation laid by WC19 wheelchairs will um, make uh, create a situation where um, th there that can happen. So. I got disconnected. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: Was the seating prototype that's been developed by Molon Labs? Uh, considered uh, that prototype locks into place, allows the wheelchair to lock, lock into place, like on a bus or train. I'll take this yeah, one, Miriam. Alan. Well, I don't know that Miriam's familiar with what Molon Law Base. It's one of the concepts. Um, it is not the only concept out there. Um, again, we were just looking at technical feasibility of a, you know, from an engineering perspective. Um, and as I said, in my 30 plus years in this industry, um, the suppliers and the OEMs are going to come up with solutions we can't even dream of right now um, the, to address, um, you know, new, new constraints that are put on them. Um, so I would say that, you know, we didn't specifically um, consider the, you know, um, Mullen Labe's specific solution. Um, we were looking at, you know, a variety of, of, uh, of different options. Um, but again, it's our charge is not to define what that solution might be, but just whether a solution was technically feasible. Thanks, Gary. So uh, the next question, um, so the concept 
that the study committee looked at, uh, would that preclude users of manual wheelchairs that may want to continue uh, with uh, transferring directly into airline seats and staying in those seats for the flight and having their uh, manual wheelchair folded and stowed uh, in the cabin? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. We discussed these kinds of issues in our deliberations and the committee in no way took a stand on whether or not people should be required to use one approach or the other. Uh, my personal view would be, I'd hope people would be given the flexibility to use whatever approach to um, flying that they wish to use going forward. But the committee did not take an official stand on any type of requirement of one system or another. Thank you. Next question. Um, so did the committee consider um, the specific way that uh, a wheelchair would be maneuvered into place uh, into the securement area? Uh, specifically, would they have to back in would they be able to go in forward and turn around into place? Um, could the committee please address that? Gary or Miriam, you want to speak to that? I can, unless Miriam, you want to do it. Um, well, I'll start and then Gary, you jump in if I miss something. Um, so basically we, we use that precedent of ADA accessibility. Um, which does make some um, assumptions about approaching and entering um, the spot, but it doesn't. Um, so, so we we're sort of relying on the fact that this is a solution, um, or the ADA requirements um, create a, a, an area where um, certain solutions might be easier or harder. Obviously, if you have a small smaller wheelchair wheelchair with a center wheel drive, it might be very maneuverable and you'd have more options on how you get in there. Um, it could be that if you have a very long wheelchair that there's only one um, path that would work or one strategy that would work. Um, but I think that using, because we know that this approach has uh, provided sufficient access or a good level of access in other modes of public transportation, that it would be an acceptable starting point for this. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question notes that uh, regional jets, such, such as the uh, EMB and the ERJ, um, which are the models uh, where the majority of planes are used for regional flights, uh, that they have door widths of 26.4 and 28.3 inches respectively. Uh, what would need to happen to allow securement systems to be used on regional jets? Yeah, I'll take that yeah. one. I'll take that one. So, um, first of all, the you know the the one thirty five, one forty, and one forty five, the smaller Embraer, older um, you know regional jets are are um, I would say going out of favor. Um, they're less than six percent of the fleet are those. Um, they actually have a max door inch width of uh, twenty eight point six inches um, of the max width, and that's where your thirty inches is. So you know there may be you know Alan talked about. Um, you know, a, a, a reasonable level of service, you know, could there be some cities that, uh, you know, only see a Q400 or an ERJ, you know, or I'm sorry, or Embraer 145 that maybe couldn't accommodate all the wheelchairs? There could be. Um, you know, when you get into the ERJs, though, they do have a max door width of 30 inches, so you still could get um, you know, an aircraft in there and, and you know, the, the A220, the CRJs, um, you know, which are the other regional aircraft out there also have uh, door widths at or above uh, 30 inches. So it's a relatively small portion of the U.S. fleet um, that is kind of these, these older, um, smaller regional jets of the Embraer 135, 140, and 145. But uh, they certainly were, you know, included in our, our overall analysis. Great, thank you. We are uh, just about out of time for the uh, question and answer portion of this uh, webinar today. 
but uh, a couple other questions that I think we can uh, fit in here. And this is something I believe that's been touched on already, but I think merits repeating. Uh, looking ahead in terms of uh, the next steps, what can the committee tell us about the next steps in this process? And also what uh, those in the advocacy community might be able to do to help advance the issue. Thanks for that question. I, I tried to outline in my remarks the need for the US Department of Transportation to develop a roadmap for future research that needs to be done. And we had two major recommendations in terms of filling in the information gaps that we could not address with existing evidence as a committee. I think moving forward, in order for those recommendations to be implemented, the US Congress would need to take steps in terms of allocating resources. And I think that's where interested parties can be effective and helpful in trying to encourage Congress to continue to move forward as they did in commissioning this initial feasibility study. Great, thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, I'll just read uh, two more questions and then we'll uh, move into our closing remarks. Um, so one of the questions uh, that I think it's been addressed, uh, but we could just uh, revisit it again since uh, users of manual wheelchairs were also, uh, you know, to be considered in this study. Uh, how would manual wheelchairs be able to be uh, accommodated using these systems? Mary, we want to address that issue again? Uh, sure. So right now, um, both the ADA requirements and the methods for securing a wheelchair in a motor vehicle um, include accommodation of people in both manual wheelchairs and in power wheelchairs. And so since we um, based our work on, on, on those um, premises, there isn't, I, I don't see any barriers in having manual wheelchairs be included um, along with power wheelchairs. Thank you. Uh, and the final question, uh, have you officially made these recommendations to the DOT and FAA? and advise them on doing further studies on this issue. As you had mentioned earlier, Mario, we did brief congressional staff on our committee report and the specific recommendations. And we have made our report available to all who have presented uh, to us. And so, yes, that would include the Department of Transportation and the FAA. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we are at the end of the question and answer portion of the session today. I will now uh, turn the floor to Mr. Greg Farabach, Chair of the U.S. Access Board. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, very, very innovative and fascinating opportunity today. Uh, I know I always, I always liked it too. Uh, when the Wright brothers decided to see if we can fly. Uh, this is one of those difficult, uh, but very positive things if we can pull off uh, what needs to be done. So uh, that said, uh, I want to thank Dr. Jeanette, Ms. Armington, uh, Ms. Mannery, and, and Mr. Wessel uh, for the insightful presentation, and as well as taking the time to answer some very good questions that we've uh, fielded this afternoon. More research. Uh, and other work needs to be done on this. Uh, we are beginning, and uh, we certainly hope this is another step towards a more equitable future for air traveling for uh, people with disabilities. We at the Access Board are committed to doing what we can to help further explore uh, this issue and stand ready to work with our other agency partners uh, in the next uh, several months and years ahead uh, to see we can accomplish this. But in the meantime, we thank you uh, and the committee members and our good friends at, at TRB for the uh, hard work on this study. 
uh, very beneficial. For those of you who are still listening or, or uh, want further information, uh, please uh, uh, send your follow-up questions to the Access Board's technical point of contact for this study. Uh, Mario Damani, uh, and, and congratulations to you, Mario. Uh, well done in helping facilitate this uh, conversation this afternoon. Uh, the board uh, gives its hats off to you. Uh, and that contact is uh, D-A-M-I-A-N-A at access-board.gov. And uh, so enjoy the rest of your, your week and your weekend. So uh, I look forward to uh, more positive things to uh, continue. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, this is Rosemary Access Board, and I wish to thank Jackie and Jalinda and Kayla, if she's still out there, and Lauren, thank you for staying with us. We are now at break. The time now is 2.55, but we are at break. We will resume at 3.30 for the official meeting of the full board. Rose, are you still there? I am still here, keeping the light on. Go oh, ahead. Good. Uh, is it necessary to leave our, our lines open or start over again? If you need to leave and come back, yes, uh, you can um, use the exact same um, link that you used for 3.30. And we resume at 5 o'clock? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll see you. Uh, if you need to leave and come back, go ahead and do so now. Thank you. But we, we, seriously, we resume at 3.30, correct? 3.30. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll see you then. Okay.
Good afternoon, good afternoon. This is Rosemary Access Board. Do I have captioning ready? Lauren, Lauren, captioner. Come in, captioner. Rose, can you hear me? Hear me? Uh, two thumbs up. Okay, thank you.
my video check, sound check. One more time, Jackie. Video check, sound check. Perfect. And video check, sound check for Delinda. Likewise. Excellent. Thank you. Ditto. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Rosemary Access Board. Attention Access Board. It is 3.23 p.m. We will be, we will be starting shortly. And the rest of the Access Board, yeah, we will. This is your five minute warning. Rose, this is Greg. Will you be uh, putting us back on gallery? Hey, Greg, you're shooting gallery mode. Right now on my screen, it says meeting of the access board will resume at 3.30. I will stop the screen share at 3.30. Sorry, we'll start the screen here at 3 30. All right, very good. Thank you.
Yeah, if you could help me figure out where I gotta go, I gotta go to a special place to have that Good afternoon, this is Rosemary. Jackie Lightfoot, are you ready? Jackie Lightfoot? Yes, I am. Do I have Jalinda, interpreter? Ready? She's also ready. Good afternoon, I'm here. Okay, and uh, captioner Lauren. Captioner Lauren. Ready position, please. And Mr. Chairman, I just saw Sachin Pavitran, I know is on the list. It is 3.28 PM, Access Board, this is your two minute warning. All right, good afternoon to everyone. Again, good afternoon to everyone. and Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Greg Ferrybach, and I am the chairman of the United States Access Board. And uh, it is now my pleasure to call the September 2021 meeting of the Access Board to order on this, the 22nd day of December, 
2021. Welcome to everyone. Uh, at this time, I'm going to uh, ask that uh, Rose Marie will call the roll of uh, those of us present. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rosemary Access Board. When you hear your name, please say that you are present. Health and Human Services, Allison Barkoff. Allison is not here today. She gives her proxy to the chair. This is Brian Bard from HHS. Noted, thank you very much. Karen Breitmeyer. Meyer. Present. Patrick Cannon. I am here. Department of Justice, Kristen Clark. Christina Galindo Walsh for Ms. Clark, proxy to the chair. Gregory Farabak. Present. Mark Guthrie. Present. Christopher Hart. Department of Transportation. Good afternoon, this is Robin Hutchison, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, General Services Administration, Katie Kale. Present. Matthew McCullough. Here. Department of Education, Katie Knees. This is Tanya Steller attending for Catherine Knees, Acting Assistant Secretary of OSERS. Thank you. Uh, Victor Pineda. Victor Pineda. Howard Rosenblum. I'm present. Deb Ryan. Present. U.S. Postal Service, Tom Sambra. Shelly Siegel. Karen Tamley. Present. Department of the Interior, Rachel Taylor. Department of Labor, Taryn Williams. Janet Voigt, proxy to the chair. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Janine Warden. Department of Commerce. Do I have Monique Dismuke? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have for the record a proxy to the chair from Department of Commerce. Department of Defense. Veterans Affairs. Mark Cole of the Exxon present. Okay, did I miss anybody? Victor Pineda. Sure. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pineda. Mr. Chairman, we do not have a quorum. Thank you, Rose. Uh, the quorum has failed, and that any voting items uh, will be tabled uh, to the next meeting of the full board which is November uh, 2021. And uh, at this time, I'm going to ask also too, we have been uh, honored to have some new uh, federal members uh, who are our partners uh, in this uh, uh, committee and board to uh, kind of give a brief introduction of themselves. I'd like to start off uh, first with uh, GSA. Uh, we have a new uh, member uh, attending for us. So uh, Kayla, you wanna go ahead and do it? Absolutely, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Katie Kale. I am the Deputy Administrator of GSA. 
I have been here since January uh, 20th, uh, 2021, um, but I am returning um, after four years uh, to GSA. I was the chief of staff during the last year and a half of the Obama um, Biden administration. Um, prior to my time at GSA, I spent six and a half years at, of senior leadership in the Obama White House and uh, more than or about 10 years uh, before that in the United States Senate, working with several senators um, on operational and legislative matters. Very excited to be here. Um, one of our GSA priorities is around diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Uh, that is also a personal priority for me in the work that we're doing while um, uh, during this administration while I am here. So thank you so much for having me. Look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, and uh, I hope you enjoy your time with us because we will certainly benefit from uh, your wealth of knowledge uh, in government. So thank you. Department of Transportation. Hello, I apologize. Um, I, I just apologize in advance. I've had technological issues all day long. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for recognizing me. I introduced myself earlier, Robin Hutchison, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy. And within my portfolio, um, I uh, focus on safety for all users of our transportation network. Um, and that means a focus on the disabled community. Um, we know and you know that nearly one in 10 uh, people have some kind of disability. And our transportation system does not always accommodate adequately. It's been 50 years since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, and we have a lot of a long way to go uh, to make good on that act and to build our infrastructure appropriately. We're really looking ahead, looking forward to, uh, fingers crossed, additional resources to upgrade the nation's infrastructure. Um, should we be fortunate enough to um, have that increase? Um, we intend to um, provide additional resources to communities to, to simply build better transportation networks for all people who travel. I appreciate you joining today. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> Welcome. And uh, glad that uh, you're a part of that. You uh, so accurate when you talk about uh, transportation being a, a cornerstone to inclusiveness and, and uh, economic equity. Uh, so thank you for, for having us and uh, thank the secretary for appointing you to participate for us. Today. Thank you, thank I you. misspoke. I said, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me join you is what I meant to say. Um, and on behalf of the Department of Transportation. We're all in this together. So uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Hopefully my internet doesn't go out again and I can participate for the whole time. We certainly all are all in it together on the screen. We are. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I think that uh, we will now move to the executive director's report. Uh, Mr. Sachin Pavlin. Uh, Sachin, are you? Uh, yes, ready? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our board meeting today and a special welcome to um, Katie and Robin. Thank you for making time to join us and looking forward to working with uh, both of you in all the different areas that uh, we can partner and collaborate. And, and once again, thank you for making time to join us. Um, to start off with, uh, I, I have a sad news uh, that I want to bring to all of your attention. Uh, we found out early this morning, uh, one of uh, a, a great disability rights advocate, a leader in the disability rights uh, space, Marilyn Golden passed away late last night. Many of us have worked with Marilyn over the years. She's been a true advocate and a leader in this space, pushing for inclusion and accessibility for all people with disabilities. Um, she served on the board uh, in, from 1996 to 2005. L uh, as of late, she was the uh, she worked for disability rights education and defense fund as a special policy analyst. Uh, Marilyn has been a significant. Uh, 
advocate in all kinds of accessibility and inclusion, not just here in the US, even globally. She's well recognized in the work she has done. The impact of Marilyn's work will is going to be long lasting and we are all going to benefit from what she has done for all of us for years to come. Uh, I, I, I do want to recognize, uh, you know, what you know what a big loss the disability rights uh, the, the disability rights movement is going to have with, with her passing i also want to pass on my condolence to the family and the close friends of marilyn and our thoughts and prayers are with all of you with that uh, i want to turn to uh, the report for uh, the access board I want to start off with the Architectural Barriers Act, uh, the ABA enforcement that we are charged with. And since, uh, since mid-June to August 26th, we have received about 42 complaints out of which, uh, uh, 42 complaints and we have, uh, we have closed all those complaints where one of them resulted in corrective action. This was a United States Postal Service in Maryland, um, in this, we we corrected the action by installing a accessible path from the entrance to the um, public sidewalk. We continue to work with other uh, entities when the complaints come up, and we are working with other uh, uh, entities whenever, and also trying to promote our Architectural Barriers Act enforcement to make sure this is something that we take seriously. And we also want to make sure the word about uh, ABA enforcement is shared uh, with, with all, all those who can benefit from it. The next I want to touch on training. Since uh, the fall of last year, Access Board has done over 58 trainings, which has had over 14,000 attendees. A lot of our trainings, obviously, because of the pandemic, has been online, and we've uh, been really taking advantage of the virtual platform to get our information out there. Uh, we have standard trainings that it goes on every month on our section section 508 and our built environment we have a training coming up next week on the 29th on section 508 where we'll be joining with department of justice and um, gsa our federal partners in providing a training and our next built environment training is going to be on october 7th all of our trainings are available online archived for uh, for future viewing as well. So please do share with, uh, with your um, partners and others who you think might benefit from this. Technical assistance is another area that we continue to provide uh, services in. Um, we, have, we have provided technical assistance to over 4,000 people since in this fiscal year. And uh, we continue to provide, find different ways to provide technical assistance and uh, also working, uh, working on different guides that will help our clients and other uh, partners that we work with so that our information is available for them to use on their end. We will be releasing uh, tech, uh, some more technical guides in, in the near future, focusing on um, the accessibility of... Uh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be introducing some more um, technical guides in the near future. We are also um, working on. We are also uh, we are also working on the executive orders that has come out. So we uh, the various ex executive orders that has come out in in under this administration's um, EO one uh, EO one three one seven five and. 13985, which requires all agencies to work with tribal agencies and uh, the tri uh, tribal 
entities and also work with minority groups. So we are trying to raise awareness and also find new partners working with all the different minority groups. Uh, Access Board is committed to make sure that we are working with underserved communities and underserved population, but also making sure that those who can benefit from the information that we share is uh, that we take into consideration of all these different communities. So, and we have just recently, early August, submitted our 200 day report for the executive order 13985. Uh, the executive order that came out 14035, the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility uh, EO that came out, we are continuing to work on that as well. Uh, Access Board have a specific role in it to make sure that we address all the, uh, you know, we work with our partners to make sure accessibility is in the forefront. So we are continuing to work on that as well. But also we're looking internally, even though our, the access board's primary role is accessibility, that doesn't mean we, we that, that doesn't mean we got everything done perfectly internally. So we are looking internally as well on what we can do to improve and improve accessibility within our agency as well. But at the same time, we are working with our federal partners on how best uh, to improve accessibility across the federal government as well. We are, uh, the staff and myself, we are engaged in the conversation with, uh, with the um, executive branch on how best to uh, influence accessibility all across uh, federal government. Um, rulemaking obviously is one of our biggest uh, area of focus. Um, we have been undertaking all our rulemakings and public rights of way has been a rule that we have been focusing a lot this year. I, I am happy to say that a lot of progress has been made and uh, I hope to see a, a final rule being uh, being published in the near future. We are also starting to work on a proposed uh, proposed rule for addressing the ADA guidelines for rail, uh, ra railway vehicle accessibility guidelines, which should be coming soon as well. And also a supplementary rule on self-service transaction machines. Those three are the primary rules that the Access Board is focusing on right now. There are other rules that the Access Board will be working on as well, but these are the three primary Three, three primary rules that we are focusing on right now. Um, I also want to make a quick announcement of a staffing change that has happened recently. Scott Windley, who has been a member of our staff for the last, I want to say about 25 years now, has been promoted to be the TA coordinator for our, uh, for our agency. And we are excited to see uh, Scott to be named in this position and looking forward to his leadership to uh, improve technical assistance and see all the different ways uh, we can provide service to all the uh, all our partners and others uh, that we work with on an ongoing basis. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any questions, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Executive Director. Obviously, you can see that. Uh, we have been uh, working hard. Staff has been doing a heck of a job during this difficult uh, pandemic time, but nonetheless, the work of the board goes on. And uh, Sachin, thank you for your leadership and uh, all the team members' leadership in that too. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, all right. Uh, we are going to now move on to the uh, standing committee reports. And the first standing committee report of this afternoon is technical programs. And uh, Mr. Christopher Hart uh, and uh, Mr. Bill Botton uh, will be uh, making those presentations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, the technical programs committee on Monday afternoon, and as our executive director alluded to, the 
technical staff at the board have been extremely busy this year delivering over 4,000 responses to TA questions for assistance, and they have trained over 14,000 people uh, at our online webinars. If you want to see a breakdown of the trainings, it is in your board packet. And if you have questions about that, please reach out to Scott Wendley and Dave and Tulis. On Monday afternoon, we also had a presentation from our friends just north of the border, the Rick Hansen Foundation in Basin, China. The Rick Hansen Foundation has spent over three decades working on accessibility in Canada, trying to make Canada's built environment much more accessible. And they have an ongoing certification program for building that they wanted to review with the board. I think overall we found it quite interesting. It is based somewhat on the lead LEED Green Building Standard Model of how you award points for different design criteria. And it's really exciting that they have also partnered with Amazon and the city of Seattle for Seattle's new arena, which will seat about 17,000 people. And that arena has a number of features which, frankly, most sports arenas do not currently have. So it was a very interesting discussion and we look forward to our Canadian friends continuing to push the barriers down for access. Um, I really know I want to welcome Robin Hutchinson from USTOT. Frankly, giving the work on our point as a board, the reality is that USDOT is absolutely critical to finally adopting the PROAG rule. And I hope we can do what we did in 1991 and we can actually have GOT adopt for a almost simultaneously with, with the action sport. And that would be great. Finally, as many of you guys participated earlier today, we have really moved the ball on on aircraft access, and this again is a key DOT safety issue for people with disabilities, and we look forward to working with DOT on, on in cabin access, and hopefully, before many of us retire, actually flying in our chairs. With that, that concludes the 
technical problems committee report. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Chris. Excellent report. I appreciate uh, all the work that's going in to uh, the efforts that, uh, since our last meeting. So thank you and thanks to Bill uh, Botten and his team for helping us uh, uh, get to where we need to be. And, and uh, so hats off, Bill. Thank you. All right. Our next report is uh, the uh, Planning and Evaluation Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Karen Tamley and uh, supported by uh, Francis Spiegel uh, of our staff. Karen? Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> the Planning and Evaluation Committee met on Tuesday, and the committee discussed the format for the 2022 board meetings that will be as follows. Um, <clears throat> the January 22 meeting will be virtual. The March meeting will be in person. The May meeting will be virtual. The July meeting will be in person. And the out of town meeting will be held in September uh, 2022 in Philadelphia. And the November 22 meeting will also be virtual. Um, as you can see, we are doing a hybrid of a future in-person and virtual meeting schedule. Um, the in-person meetings, however, will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis in light of the status of the pandemic and the federal safety and travel policies that are in effect at, the at this time. The dates for the 22 board meetings are on the Access, Living or Access, Access Board's website, sorry. Staff provided an update on the hotel contracts for the 2022 in-person meetings as well. The Office of General Counsel updated the committee on the agency's COVID safety plan and informed the public board members that as special government employees, they are subject to COVID-19 vaccination requirements for federal employees. The committee then discussed the format for the November 2021 board meeting in light of the COVID-19 safety measures and the current state of the pandemic. The committee members determined that the November board meeting, which was previously scheduled to be held in person, will instead be held virtually. Finally, staff updated the committee on agency actions in response to the executive orders on equity and inclusion. With respect to executive order 13985, advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government, the Access Board has identified three focus areas, accessibility of federal facilities on and near tribal lands, accessibility of federal facilities in communities where a majority of the residents are black and outreach to underserved communities. With respect to executive order 14035, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the federal workforce, the Access Board has submitted the initial required report assessing the agency's current practices. In addition, as an additional step towards enhancing equity and inclusion within its workforce, the Access Board is engaged in a professional facilitator who will provide two workshops to Access Board staff on disability inclusion and intersectionality. Staff will keep the committee informed of its efforts under both of these executive orders. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Karen. We appreciate that. I know it's been an interesting task to figure out how to do our meetings in this uh, interesting time. So uh, uh, excellent work on uh, helping us uh, get to where we need to be. All right, our next report is going to be by the uh, uh, Budget Committee, uh, chaired by Mr. Matthew McCullough and uh, supported by uh, Jeff Sargent, uh, liaison from our staff. Matthew? Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to cover three, three years of the budget. I'm going to start with Fiscal year 2021. Um, as you guys know, 
we were given a budget of nine million two hundred thousand dollars, and we have expended ninety two point nine percent of that budget, which equals to eight million five hundred fifty one dollars. Sorry, eight million five hundred fifty one thousand three hundred five dollars. Dollars. Um, I'm going to give you an update um, of the highlights in terms of this year. Um, so, so um, I'm, I'm going to cover some some expenses. So, um, so if there were two expenses that weren't um they'll be covered this year. Um, one we had a uh, people people. Records, press for electronically. Sorry, um, and we also made some updates on on records management. Um, we also invested in equipment supporting our staff to telework, and we also updated the electronic security policies. And procedures. Um, knowing that everything went in electronically, printing costs were lower this year, um, which is a very good thing. And um, and and we also invested in, in terms of upgrading the video co conferencing equipment to support our online trainings. In other means, um, the, these investments were were um, we were able to do these investments because we had some cost savings um, in personal staffing and travel, and so so that's how we were able to cover these additional expenses during this fiscal year. Um, Let's move on to fiscal year 2022. Um, the thankfully the person budget um gave X board nine million point nine point seven five million dollars. Um the, this was included in the bills that were passed by the House on July 29th, 2021. We are still waiting on the Senate to pass um, the, this bill as well. Um, as you guys know, um, come October 1st, if the Senate does not pass this bill, that allows um, the Act Board to continue their services in the new fiscal year, um, the, the Acts Board will be faced with doing limited services during that time if the Senate does not pass um, this bill. Um, so hopefully our Congress, our senators will will go will get on the stick and pass this bill so Acts Board plus the federal government can can actually continue their services beyond October 1st. Um, let's talk about fiscal year 2023 budget requests. Um, um, since our last meeting, um, the ex board staff received final instructions from OMB um, that would cover the expenses in fiscal in 2023. Um, the, the budget Options were due to OMB last week. Um, as you guys know, when the export staff meets with the o OMB, we begin off with three different budgets. Um, one dealing with a percent cut. The second budget is dealing with the little plenty of um, $9.2 million. And we also submit a third budget um, asking for the full funding level, which, um, and um, so when we submitted the 
full quarter of the budget um, to ask for staff um, to ask for $10 million uh, at full funding. Um, the full funding level will, will, will invest $535,000 in research and, and regulatory assessments, which is definitely needed in order, in order for the dashboard to continue doing some good work going forward. Um, we, we, we expect to receive the aspect of our form from OMB by this December, and hopefully we can finalize the budget shortly afterwards. So, so I gave you a very comprehensive update over the, the budget is for the export, and it looks quite positive, and hopefully, as long as Congress does the job. So, with that in mind, are there any questions from from the export members at this time? Hearing none, that, that is my report. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you so much, Greg. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt, and your team. Uh, it's always important to know that we're solvent and uh, being very good stewards of the dollar. So thank you for, for watching over that for us. All right, uh, next is the Frontier Issues, uh, chaired by uh, uh, Howard Rosenbaum and uh, supported by uh, Tim Cragen uh, from our staff. Uh, Howard, it's all yours. Thank you, Chair. And I would like to uh, express my appreciation at this point to Tim Cregan as my liaison for assisting with yesterday's presentation that we gave to the board members on frontier issues. Yesterday's meeting was a presentation from a German company called Sennheiser, which is a German audio manufacturer. Sennheiser is one of the world's leading manufacturers of headphones, loudspeakers, microphones, and wireless transmission systems. They also develop and produce technologies for hearing assistance. The product team from Sennheiser presented to us with a demonstration of a new assistive listening system that's called Mobile Connect. Mobile Connect use, utilizes existing Wi-Fi infrastructure to stream audio to a user's own personal smart device. And that works with both Android and iOS operating systems. This approach allows users to use their personal devices in conjunction with hearing aids and or cochlear implants via Bluetooth or T-coil. This system then enables users to move freely about the classroom, theater, exhibit hall, or other public spaces without having to check out a loaner device or to sit in defined seating areas. The BYOD approach or the bring your own device model allows users to take advantage of their familiarity with their own devices and thus move around public spaces without restrictions. If there are no questions, Chair, that concludes my report. All right, thank you very much, Howard. Uh, that was a, a great report from uh, uh, the technology portion of that and the uh, sense and bombs. That was a uh, outstanding, uh, very progressive way to do that. So thank you for helping shepherd that. Our next uh, committee report is the Election Assistance Commission, and that is uh, chaired, uh, co-chaired by uh, Mr. Mark Guthrie and uh, Mr. Patrick uh, Cannon, and uh, Bruce uh, Bailey is the staff liaison. So uh, Mark and uh, Pat, it's uh, your uh, Report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, 
I'm pleased to present this on behalf of uh, Pat Cannon and myself. First, I want to thank um, the, the executive director for his kind words uh, about Marilyn Golden. Uh, Pat and I both had the opportunity to serve with Marilyn on the board, and um, uh, and I, uh, uh, you know, her, her passing is a great loss to the disabilities community. And I, I just wanted to share before I uh, give the report. I was reading since uh, Sasha um, uh, told us about her passing this morning that uh, uh, a little bit about Marilyn and. Um, I just bring your attention to an article that was uh, just this summer in Jewish Current Currents. I sent it to you, Sasha. Um, and the last, uh, it was a, an exchange back and forth between her and and uh, the reporter that was doing the article. And 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 the her closing comments were really thought provoking. And so I just want to encourage everyone to take a look at them. Again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Bruce Bailey, for um, the fine work you do uh, staffing uh, uh, Pat Cannon and I here as uh, liaisons for the board on the Election Assistance Commission uh, and its Technical uh, Guidelines Development Committee, or known as the TGDC. At the July board meeting, I reported that the EAC um, advisory board and, and it was annual meeting uh, in June. I reported on the annual meeting, which was in June. The next uh, advisory board meeting has not yet been scheduled. Uh, Pat and I, along with uh, Bruce Bailey, uh, our staff member, are scheduled to attend a meeting of the, the uh, Technical Guidelines Development Committee on October the 13th, which will be via Zoom. This committee will be providing feedback on documents that the Na National Institute of Standards and Technology is preparing that support the next version of the voluntary voting uh, system guidelines known as VVSG 2.0. Improved accessibility is a big part of VVSG 2.0. A couple of weeks ago on September 8th, the EAC held an interesting uh, public forum on moving VVSG 2.0 forward. The event was a dialogue with voting system manufacturers, uh, test labs, and representatives from the election administration community. Uh, it, uh, it featured uh, panel discussions on various aspects of the final stages of VVSG 2.0 implementation. The recording, by the way, is available on the ESC website. Um, Mr. Chairman, if uh, unless there are questions, that will conclude uh, our report uh, to the board. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, is there, if there are no questions, then uh, Mr. Guthrie, uh, we'll move on. And uh, thank you for your hard work along with our colleague, Pat Cannon, on that, too. Let's move on to the Ad Hoc Committee on Design and Guidance. Ms. Karen Breitmeyer uh, has chaired that committee, and uh, uh, Scott Windley. And uh, Scott, congratulations again on your uh, new position uh, with, uh, with the Access Board. Uh, it's, a, it's a long time coming, so congratulations to that. So, uh, Karen? Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in our meeting on Monday afternoon, uh, staff provided an update on the work to complete the remaining guides on chapter six of the ADA and ABA standards. These guides cover lavatories and sinks, washers and dryers, saunas and steam rooms. Staff circulated drafts of these guides to board members and federal liaisons for their review in August. Comments were due on September 3rd. If there are any remaining comments on these guides, please send them to Scott Finley by Friday, if possible. If anyone needs more time, please let Scott know. Staff will finalize the guides based on the comments from this review and post them to the board's website. 
the design guidance team will conduct a webinar on the three guides on October 7th. The design guidance team has turned to guides on chapter seven and is drafting one on signs. The team welcomed suggestions from board members and liaison staff on questions and issues to address in this guide. And if there are no other questions, um, that would conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Well done. And, and those uh, guidance materials have been quite uh, well received in the community. So here's to you and here's to the staff that's helped putting those together. Uh, greatly appreciated. All right. Um, prior to, uh, we're, we're set for our new business uh, portion of the other uh, meeting. But prior to that, I'd like to see if uh, uh, Ms. Hutchison and, and Ms. Kale, if you have anything you'd like to uh, report or suggest or comments uh, being your first meeting uh, on the board. You don't have to, but I certainly wanted to uh, give you that opportunity to be heard because uh, our federal members are our partners in this uh, uh, experience and we want to make sure everybody gets to be heard. So Robin, Katie. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that opportunity. I'm uh, so glad that I'm able to join today and hear the committee reports and in particular from the technical committee. Um, I learned a lot about your perspective on the work that we're doing together, certainly with um, aircraft and with adopting new uh, standards, PROAG standards that um, I think are important to, to all of us and to this group. Um, I also am fascinated about your, uh, that you have a frontiers committee, uh, very forward looking. And I actually made a, just a quick note for myself that that's such a great approach to look at emerging technologies and opportunities. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing um, uh, how that work kind of evolves as I participate along the way. Uh, so just thank you again. It was invaluable for me to, to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that and look forward to working with you those uh, these next few years. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Katie, anything we can? Well, thank you. For some reason, I can't take or put myself on um, there you video. Go. There I am. Great. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity. I have just really enjoyed listening to everything and, and can't wait to really dig into a lot of the things that you all are talking about or speaking about um, and uh, get caught up on the work that you have been doing. I also wrote down about the Frontiers Committee. I think that is a great uh, terminology and hope to uh, steal and re repurpose that and reuse that here at GSA. So already, you all are already making me smarter. Thank you. Well, thank you. We, we certainly look forward to working with you also. And uh, uh, this is be this will be uh, exciting to be a part of this, and we, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, briefly, Robin, back to you again, just for a note. Uh, you may or may not know this, but the secretary was uh, the first person I think uh, to uh, join us uh, after the new administration and um, brought comments uh, from your uh, group, the Department of Transportation, on autonomous vehicles, and uh, so uh, obviously uh, an active group of leaders uh, right now we're thrilled to have. And uh, so thanks, uh, thanks again. And, and uh, on behalf of the board, give uh, our kindest wish and support to both secretaries and, and uh, tell uh, Secretary Buttigieg, uh, I said hi. So thanks. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I will certainly do that the next time. Thank you. I know he was very, very pleased to have been able to participate even by video, in, even by video in that first event, it was great. Very cool, yep. Thank you, all right. Um, Anything else under new business? Anyone else have a new business item that they would like to see before the uh, uh, board at this time? All right. Well, uh, it's been a robust three days of the meeting of the board, and we're grateful for everyone's help to do this. Again, publicly, I just want to thank the staff uh, for helping us uh, accomplish this. Without our, our fine access board staff, uh, we would not be able to do this for 
for the committee and, and or for or for the country. So uh, cheers to the staff and, and all this uh, challenging time that we're getting it done, but the, we are getting it done. And so thank you all for that. All right. This then uh, concludes our official business for the session. And uh, we have our next meeting in uh, November and uh, we will be virtual uh, on that meeting. So uh, please stand by for those of you joining us and uh, we will have the traditional uh, information out so everyone can participate in the uh, uh, meeting uh, on that Wednesday uh, in November. And uh, until then, thanks to everyone and uh, be safe, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. This is Rosemary Access Board. Thank you to our two interpreters, Jackie and Jolinda, and captioner Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, the business is the Access Board meeting is officially over. We will see you next time in November. Thank you, Rosemary.